This last panel is meant to kind of uh, bring a, a bit of a summary to our discussions by considering the extent to which we would invite uh, the role of the uh, public sector into either uh, helping to perform some of its traditional responsibilities of protecting against risks associated with um, innovation or indeed fostering innovation by creating a landscape that um, allows it to flourish. And we've heard a little bit about that over the, over the last three days. Um, joining me today, just starting closest to me, is Oliver Goodenough with the Vermont Law School. Um, next to him is Amar, I'm not allowed to say his last name because I'll mispronounce it, um, from uh, Tufts University and down at the end, uh, Chris Brummer from the Georgetown University Law School. Uh, all of these, two, three of the four of us, I guess, are lawyers. Um, we have three from the academic world, and so I'll give a bit of a perspective to open up, and it'll be fairly short, uh, focusing on perhaps the role that uh, the public sector might have in thinking about how we think about regulating in a world where uh, financial technologies innovate at lightning speed. So. So what is the goal of our financial services industry? Um, it is the provision of basic services. <clears throat> uh, this is risk management, uh, liquidity transformation, and so forth. Uh, it is creation of uh, reliable infrastructure, whether that's a payment system or banking systems. And it is, uh, I would argue, maybe most importantly, um, the uh, creation of trust and confidence in the system so that the system is something that people will continue to go to uh, in order to uh, receive these basic services. Now, we all know that uh, that trust uh, and confidence in our system uh, is, I guess, most obvious in the banking world. But I think a lot of what we've talked about over the last couple of days is the extent to which uh, the, 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 the providers of technology have gained some level of trust uh, by people uh, who are using these technologies, perhaps without even contemplating whether that's appropriate. I think I forget who, was, uh, who it was that made the comment yesterday that uh, everybody has a higher rating than Congress. Most people are higher rating than government. Um, but, um, and even lawyers, I think, are improving right now. Um, but technologists and technology firms have this uh, remarkably high rate, um, even in light of things like the Equifax breach and things like that. And it's really quite remarkable. And I think I'd like to think a, a little bit about the role that government plays in that. So the tools available to governments are... Um, are ex ante rules, uh, regulations, laws. Um, <clears throat> one of the uh, complexities that I'll talk about in a, in a minute is, you know, these are very cumbersome, slow-moving processes uh, undergirded by uh, constitutional rights and interests to uh, access to information and informed decision-making, um, perhaps not very well suited to a fast-changing environment. Uh, another are the ex post rules, the ability to use enforcement um, or uh, other inspection mechanisms to try to control and persuade behavior. The difficulty there um, is uh, the harm may be done, um, but the difficulty there is also uh, that uh, the, 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 the rules get made by exception uh, rather than through these more open processes. Uh, then there are other solutions that are perhaps more adaptive, things like moral suasion. So we, of course, know that bank regulators will uh, use these inspection processes to coddle uh, their uh, regulatees into, into certain behaviors. Um, we, I think, increasingly have been talking about, um, well, there's certainly self-help, disclosure mechanisms, and so forth. Um, we have been increasingly focused, I think, at, at, at this event about governance systems. I've heard many, many times uh, people raise the existence of a governance system as, a, as, as an ability or a, a mechanism that can help bring the level of confidence and trust in whatever it is the thing is um, that will then drive uh, people toward the infrastructure or the technology. I don't have the ability to look here for some reason, so I have to look up to see what I'm going to say. Uh, on the rulemaking process, a couple of thoughts about this. One, it's a very difficult uh, 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 process. It, it requires, generally speaking, uh, governance under something called the Administrative Procedures Act. I'm sure most of you are familiar with that. Um, public comment. Somebody before had a slide that talked about you know, all of these 
uh, chain letters. Uh, for some reason, there's a, I think it's a University of Wisconsin at Madison. There's a, there's a class when I was at the SEC that we would get 150 letters, every rule we would write um, from this one group of students. And you see this over and over again, um, that you have to parse through all of these, all of these public comments. I think the, the life cycle of a rulemaking is every three years is, is, is really the, the, the fastest opportunity to revisit a rule. A law is every seven years. Um, I'll turn to some of the human complexities of creating some of these rules. Um, the, the political uh, bandwidth for bringing a rule or, or any kind of regulatory uh, solution is very limited. You have the people that come into office, generally speaking, serving a two to three year term in these regulatory agencies, sometimes a little bit longer, often a, a quite a bit shorter. They have limited time to focus on the very uh, few agenda items that they want to focus on. Sometimes they're imposed by outsiders, either a crisis or a law. So the last seven, eight years have, have been all around the implementation of Dodd-Frank. Uh, and that has occupied most of the regulatory calendar for a number of these regulatory agencies. Um, you also have this issue of the, of the civil service as opposed to the political class in many ways being the one continuous thread that guides the rulemaking. And I would say as a civil servant that risk aversion is probably the principal driver of when you put something on the agenda. Because if you put something on the agenda and it fails, so does your career. Um, and <laughs> And if you, uh, if you uh, have the, the luxury of being able to try to seed the agenda, you're certainly going to seed it with things that are potentially just selfish, right, most advantageous to your career, but also most defensive. Um, so it's very difficult to try to think proactively about what kind of, of rulemaking agenda should be appropriate that would seed a, a better market, for example, in the future. Um, and, and instead, we find ourselves quite reactive. So some of the uh, alternatives to regulation, given that this is such a cumbersome process, uh, would include uh, guidance. I, I think a friend from the CFPB was talking a little bit about that in the last panel. There are great upsides to staff guidance, even uh, agency guidance, in that it can be far more responsive and nimble to a request for guidance, no action, things of that sort. The downside, of course, is that it does avoid this process that you know, by our legislature that created the Administrative Procedures Act um, is viewed as a positive process of gaining as much input as possible to make the best set of decisions as possible. If you have uh, no action guidance or staff guidance, you have a far more limited, highly expert, but far more limited group of people making decisions that ultimately, even if they're narrowly tailored around the specific institution that has sought the, uh, re the relief, the lawyer's bar will get out there and make sure that their clients all know that this relief is out there and it has the effect oftentimes of becoming um, something of a regulation itself. Um, policy frameworks, more general principles is another approach that can be more flexible in terms of fostering a more innovative uh, environment. Um, relying, doing nothing in sort of a wait and see environment. I think Elizabeth talked a little bit about that uh, with the uh, FSB principles on uh, FinTech. That approach has been like we see potential risks here, but we don't think we're going to do anything yet. We're going to rely on typical or existing uh, rules and uh, enforcement mechanisms to be able to control against the kinds of risks we see as possible, and, and we'll monitor closely. And then governance frameworks. And a, a brief word about, uh, I, so anybody that's ever seen me in front of a microphone knows that I don't pass up an opportunity to talk about the LEI, which is the legal entity identifier. Um, and one of the, one, this is a, uh, it's like a barcode for financial companies. As of today, about 750,000 entities around the world have an LEI, largely in part because of two authorities. One, the US CFTC, which required that you get one in order to do a swap in the US. And one, because of the European uh, uh, Securities Market Authority, which is now, as of January 1st, requiring under MIFID II that you get one before you engage in any kind of a trade. Those regulatory mandates require entities to go out and get this 20-character code from a not-for-profit organization or one of these 30 utilities around the world that are not government entities. 
yet they baked into their regulations the requirement to go and get this code. And the only reason authorities were willing to do this is because we had created a governance system that we felt like we could rely upon. So we have an oversight board that looks over a foundation in Switzerland that we created. That foundation has a fiduciary obligation to our requirements, open data, high quality data, even an equal access to market participants. And then we have a set of contracts between that foundation and the utilities around the globe that hand out the LEIs that also require adherence to those principles. So there's an example where the public sector working with the private sector was able to create a governance system that we then could rely on to the extent that we were willing to write it into laws that we can't change for three or four years um, and, and, and know that the private sector could provide this solution in a more flexible way, but on an ongoing basis. Um, the last uh, point I wanted to make was to uh, talk a little bit about the complexity that we face in, in these, I just like monkeys, there's really nothing to this. Um, the, the complexities that we, make, uh, we face in, in trying to decide whether and when to involve ourselves in a particular problem that the market faces or, the, or more broadly that uh, the public faces. And I do the, I'll introduce this as a way of, of seeding our conversation with three basic questions. Um, the first one would be, how do we handle these tribal issues that Jillian Tett was talking about the other day? Um, we are highly specialized in what we do. I, I'm not, but there are securities lawyers who are focused very discreetly, not only on securities laws, but on the 33 Act or the 40 Act. There are banking lawyers. There are all kinds of specialists in economics that are highly specialized in what we do, and none of us are really focused on the technology piece of it to the level that would be necessary to truly understand and comprehend uh, the potential risks exposed by the technology. There's this concept of regulatory capture, but there's, I think, a more difficult concept of soft capture, where those that are regulated know more than those that regulate the regulatees. And the difficulty in technology, I think, is even more pronounced, because we are in a position of having to rely upon uh, what the technologists talk about um, as, as, as the technology being capable of doing and the little risk that they provide and so forth. And we heard a bit about this before, and I think that's one of the first questions I would have is as authorities, how do, we, how do we avoid these issues? How do we equip ourselves to be able to understand enough to do our jobs? A second and related question is, you know, how do you know when to spend time and resources and money and your limited political agenda focusing on any new innovation? Uh, what are the threshold signals or questions that we should be asking uh, to decide whether is this blockchain thing really for real or do we need to focus on it? We know it, I think it has taken several years for us to finally get to the point where uh, we're seeing uh, uh, capital flow into investing into uh, these technologies and so now we're paying attention. What are the other markers for us? And then uh, finally, unintended consequences. I think Kamar might talk a little bit about uh, rating agencies and it, it provoked in my mind an uh, 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 anecdote I had learned some years ago about how the, how the uh, Xerox machine created the crisis of 2007 and 8. Um, and it did so because, this is a stretch, but you know, it used to be that our rating agencies were paid, or they made their money by selling their ratings to the brokers. And they would do so, and you would get your, your rating book every whatever it was, every quarter, every month. Um, and that's how you would provide your advice to your clients and make your decisions. And then Xerox was invented. And people started Xeroxing those ratings and handing them out on the trading floor. And so all of a sudden, the business model of the rating agencies was broken. So they turned to the issuer paid model. And that, of course, has led to questions around the, uh, the conflicts of interest between an issuer paid model and the ability to shop around for those ratings. Um, and then, of course, we follow that with the, uh, the rather uh, 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 helpful ratings of all these mortgage-backed securities that eventually led into the crisis. So the bottom line question is, how do we, that's a, a, a 30 year attenuation, but how do we think about unintended consequences as we're looking at some of these uh, innovations that maybe don't have obvious implications now, but could have other implications down the road. So I'll turn it over to, I think uh, Oliver was gonna speak next. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Uh, um, um, one of the, the things of following Matt is you've got to always readjust the microphone down if you're, if you're my height. Um, uh, I'm uh, going to talk to you today uh, about um, uh, sort of two and a half principal points, a little background in two and a half principal points. Um, and the, when, 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 when the machine comes up, uh, you'll see that the two uh, principal points I'm going to make, one of them is to explore the notion of generativity as a lens to look at regulatory processes through. I'm, I'm not going to suggest it's the only piece we should look at, but it's, it's certainly one of the pieces. Uh, I'm then going to, to, to do, do what my, my, my former friends, at the, my, my, still my friends, but my former colleagues at the um, um, OFR said was my pants on fire act, which is um, to talk about uh, where I think uh, uh, some of the next problems for the financial system are coming and, and what we can do to remediate rather than, than to prevent. Uh, and then uh, uh, finally, a, a, a little fun for, for, for us as academics, or for me at any rate as academics to think about. Okay? So, uh, framing. Uh, first of all, I'm going to remind a little of the goals and tools of regulation and some traditional ideas of good rules. Uh, frame one, uh, generativity. Frame two, remediation and repair. And a final thought. Uh, by the way, in my final thought, I, I'm, I, I'm thinking about money and finance differently. I, I, I've been trying to come up with a term, and I like the term credo currency for, instead of fiat currency, which is, you know, currency because they said so. This is credo currency, currency because I believe it. Uh, and then I went online to look for it and see if somebody else had done that, and there's a company out there called credo currency. So there we go. I'm, I'm, I'm behind the curve there as well. Um, so, common goals of government. You've heard some already. Uh, this, is, this is government 101, right? Uh, uh, preventing harm. Uh, providing an institutional framework for private creativity. That's a piece I'm not going to talk so much about today, but it's a key element in, in uh, the government's role with all of these, these uh, uh, financial innovations. Um, uh, for instance, in Vermont, where I'm, I'm, I'm from, uh, Vermont uh, uh, passed the first blockchain evidentiary recognition bill in the United States, which I had a, a, a modest role in helping to draft, um, uh, and with the goal of enabling this stuff, okay, uh, yes, blame us. And indeed, the legislature there is, going, is thinking about what else it could do to help put a, a, an enabling wrapper out there for some of these, these financial um, innovations. Uh, again, we're, I'm not going to talk so much about that, but, but we should never forget that that's a piece of what government does, is that it, is it helps these things have frameworks within which they can be reliably pursued. Raising public revenue, got to get taxes, got to get taxes. Uh, we're, in Vermont, again, we're talking about uh, legalizing marijuana partly so we can tax it. Uh, if, you, if you put a regulatory structure on, on, on uh, fintech, you know, you can do some, some of the same thing. Um, um, uh, uh, if, if we had an enabling structure for cryptocurrency, uh, should Vermont take its taxes in the cryptocurrency? If you layer it on as, as, a, as a charge, you're shaking his head, no. If you layer it on as a charge of like mining, you know, and, and, and create new currency and it goes to, straight to the state, maybe that makes, I don't know, anyway, we'll, we'll talk about that uh, later. Protecting existing interests. This is the, the capture piece. It's not just capture. We do sometimes intend to protect existing interests because damaging them can, can, be, can be difficult. Um, uh, mitigating wider and secondary effects, clearly. Systemic concerns, the Office of Financial Research particularly tasked with that, you know, th thinking more broadly about harm. And then this notion of, of repair and remediation, which I'm going to come back to uh, occasionally. And then with that set of kind of goals in mind, what are our tools? As, as, as Matt has already said to some degree, we, we have um, a, a set of ex-ante regulatory tools where we can put in requirements and prohibitions and filings and approvals and qualifications and best practices and all of these ways of sort of putting different shapes of hurdles in front of, 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 of the activity itself uh, that you, 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 you need to, to come at. And then we can also think about ex post regulation and, and uh, uh, outcome linked often. Uh, uh, it, you know, if something goes wrong, then we'll come in. You, you take care of making it all right, but if something goes wrong, guess who's on the hook? But even there, we've got, we've got um, nuances. We've got civil liability. We've got negligence style liability. We've got strict liability. We've got, um, uh, as we'll see in a little bit, the, the, the corporate uh, limited liability, all these different approaches to it. You can have criminal liability. We tend not to invoke that that much in the, in the, uh, the, the, uh, the financial industry. Uh, the, the meltdown um, uh, uh, could have led to a bunch of prosecutions, perhaps, um, uh, and, and didn't. Uh, one can argue back and forth about the, the effect of that on the moral hazard calculations. Anyway, the, 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 it's, it's out there, except in cases of really sort of intentional fraud. We, we, I think in the financial industry, we rarely see them invoked. Um, and again, repair and remediation is an ex, ex post kind of, kind of a, 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 a effect. 
Now, traditionally, when we're considering what is a good rule, what is a good rule? Um, 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 uh, the classic sort of economic calculus that has often come in has been uh, one of optimization. We, we, we have a, a, a risk-benefit analysis. Um, uh, we uh, are seeking to internalize the costs and benefits to providers and users so that the incentive structures uh, align properly, we think, under those circumstances. Uh, we sometimes avoid, try and avoid burdening the activity with, 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 with undue kinds of burdens that would get in its way. Um, we uh, uh, try and avoid rent-seeking and predation. You know, obviously, uh, uh, if you can got, get a monopoly power, we get that rent-seeking. Uh, again, these are all, all the classic sort of, sort of ec economic style analysis. Uh, I would re repeat, creating a reliable transaction framework, not to be underestimated. Um, uh, uh, economists sometimes presume that, the, that, that any transaction that could occur can occur because it should occur. And uh, uh, unless you've got a, 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 some kind of reliability pathway there, uh, it may well not occur. You have to get, get those pathways there. Um, and then there's private and public goods characteristics of the activity. Uh, uh, again, will private, will private uh, uh, incentives line up to, to create a, a public uh, a benefit of some kind? If not, then it's, you know, we have public goods style things. Anyway, there's a classic set of these, these, these markers that we would, would, would put, put out there in, in imagining into this. Another one was, is social acceptance. All right, this isn't economic, this is more sociological. Social acceptance, does it fit with cultural norms and conditions? The U.S. is a much more uh, uh, sort, of, sort of economic libertarian country than, say, the European, many of the European countries. You're just going to see a different thing. That was Lithuania that was mentioned as the spot where, 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 where the government is, is now, the, the, uh, I don't know that, that we get that in the U.S. Uh, there's some skepticism about whether that would be a cultural fit with our, our, our norms and conditions. Uh, and then fairness, fairness. Um, uh, um, uh, uh, the fairness argument uh, is, is, is uh, being invoked significantly uh, these days around some, some policy decisions in, in Washington. Um, uh, again, it, it, is, it has, has some traction uh, about fairness in application and distribution. Let me think, ask you to think about a slightly different one. I think at any rate is, is somewhat different, and I've been, been working on this for a little bit, which is the notion of generativity. I think this is particularly in, uh, important if we're going to be talking about innovation style regulation. Why? Because uh, Jonathan Citrin um, um, at Harvard um, um, uh, uh, had a, uh, an article which affected me to a significant degree, which was the generative internet. It goes back to 2006. And the, the criteria of generativity is, is essentially to have kind of open standards within which you can build something, a framework to give coherence, but the end result are things you did not anticipate when you came up with the rule. So the, the generative idea uh, is, is that, that you're going to have a, a, a set of, 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 of things you put together that, that, that you're just not going to know whether that, what's going to happen once you turn them all loose. Um, uh, for instance, um, uh, 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 the, his definition of generativity is a system's capacity to produce unanticipated change through un, uh, uh, unfiltered contributions from broad and varied audiences. Uh, it's not the same as efficiency. It's just not that same thing. It's, again, it's a, it's a capacity of a system, not the motivations of actors within the system. Okay, the mo I, I have the motivation to fly. If I could uh, do some, some physical thing and fly to the back of the room, I would be, you know, millions of dollars would flow my way. I have a huge motivation to do that. I don't have the capacity. And again, systems that, that are open to, to new stuff is a capacity of the system rather than a motivation of the individual players within it. So again, we're talking about a kind of a capacity thing. So it's not the same as that. What are some of the examples of this? Um, uh, we see um, uh, many instantiation. Genes. Genes have this. Many, often it's building block style things. The genetic building code um, uh, gets us, it gets my, uh, 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 little microbes, it gets all of this. When, when, the, when the, the, the four DNA elements uh, uh, came into, into being, however that happened, um, uh, the, the, the humans were not yet, or elephants or, or whatever it is, were not yet anticipated. Uh, Language has this. Language, the recombination of nouns, verbs, etc., within a grammar, have the capacity to do things. I can make a sentence here in front of you which no one has ever said before. Um, and it's taken me a minute to think about um, uh, 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 microbes eat donuts on Sunday. Maybe someone said that, but maybe not. You know, but I can, I can, I, you know, I, you can, you can do stuff that, that with with that which which you did not anticipate when you started up. Law, law actually has a lot of this. Uh, not, not, not necessarily the regulatory side so much, but, but private law. I teach corporations. The corporation is a hugely generative legal structure. 
When the corporation was initially done, people did not anticipate you know, a bunch of the stuff that happens in preferred stock, but the laws made it possible and people could do it. Contracting. Contracting is, is this all over the place, right? People are sticking together obligation sets. Um, uh, constitutions actually are generative documents typically. I, I'll have that argument back with, with some of my friends on the, uh, with another philosophical view of them, but I view them as, as being purposefully generative that we, we can create things we didn't anticipate when we started out. Internet, as, as, Citrin, as uh, Citrin says, is, is that way. Finance, finance, the, the, uh, uh, finance has a lot of these properties partly because it rests on, 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 on contract and corporation. It has that ability for people to stick the building blocks together. The Lego of finance can be put together in new ways and put if you got something else that you didn't fully anticipate. And that's partly its genius, right? And partly its danger, partly its danger. Uh, because uh, 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 generative systems have dangers. They're less stable than locked down systems, right? Because they, they inherently are supposed to be less stable. They're supposed to be open to things you didn't know were going to happen. Uh, the new may be accidentally damaging. Ooh, where did that come from? This is your unintended consequences piece. You know, that, that we, if we open to generativity, we are open to unintended consequences. We can try and anticipate, but the entire ethos says we are going to open to stuff we didn't know what was going to happen. Um, secondly, um, um, uh, the new will be disruptive. That's the intended consequences. The new will be disruptive. It'll be, uh, it will be at least in, uh, disruptive, even if not damagingly so. And the possibility of predation increases. Uh, Zittrain wrote a book called The Future of the Internet and Hard, How to Avoid It, in which he uh, 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 was, was basically arguing that we were going to retreat back from this open structure, which was full of the opportunity for predation, and back into more regulated and constrained and, 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 and guarded kinds of structures, because uh, the predators were going to figure it out faster than we did, and, and, and we would have to retreat. And to some degree, that's, that's been the case. And to some degree, that may be the, 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 the financial systems story. I mean, think about the, the loan packaging uh, before 2008. Uh, you know, folks who had figured it out. Um, uh, not everybody, but a lot of folks were doing kind of kind of a fairly predatory activity in that in that context. Um, um, so anyway, we, we we see that this 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 um, generativity principle has has dangers, but it also is a a, a, a a the property is a very good one if you're trying to move the ball forward in some way uh, because because uh, uh, it allows you to it allows you to discover innovation and not just plan innovation. So what do we see uh, in, in our regulatory thing? I've said in, in the slide I sort of skipped through a little bit. Uh, are we wanting to think about regulatory generativity as, as, a, as a property to consider when we're doing um, um, uh, the, this, this regulatory um, uh, structuring that we, 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 we view? Um, prescriptive regulatory schemes are clearly the antithesis of generativity. Uh, prohibiting the new, most anti-generative. The precautionary principle, the precautionary principle is inherently non anti-generative because it says if you don't know what's going to happen, don't do it. That in its rawest, most thorough version of the precautionary principle is that, and that's, that, that is directly against that. Now, if you're dealing with radioactivity or, 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 or reintroducing um, uh, the, the, the smallpox virus, I'm, you know, I'm on board, you know, I'm, I'm on board with the, the, uh, the precautionary principle there. You're dealing with finance, Ew, you know, where do, we, where do we go with that? It's an interesting, interesting quest, set of questions. Uh, so anyway, uh, you can uh, accomplish this indirectly as well by prohibiting or burdening the risky shutting down openness in a variety of ways. Entrenchment of current practice. Uh, um, uh, motives uh, can be good, best practices, today's best practice is tomorrow's state jacket. Um, there we go, we can protect incumbents, a bunch of things there. So, if we're trying to create generative rules, we need to favor ex post over ex ante, probably. I mean, these are just some principles to think about, because uh, you know, ex ante tends to shut it down, ex post says, okay, do, do your worst, and by the way, if it doesn't work, then we'll get you. Uh, create positive frameworks, taxes, I said, create sandboxes and other permissible innovation spaces with low intervention. Um, in ex ante rules, create safe harbors, industry oversight and rule structures. Uh, the the, uh, the um, um, uh, no action letter might fall in here as, as a relatively um, 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 uh, low burden piece. In ex post, punish negligence and fraud rather than well intentioned mistakes. Um, and then um, uh, business judgment and limited liability we see already in corporations' laws doing that. Are we too uncomfortable? Feel better, the next crash will happen anyway. All right, it's because it's just going to happen. All right, uh, what's the regulator, regulator to do? What should the industry ask it to do? We can say, no tech. Well, you know, that's not going to happen. So we can seek to prevent it. And yes, please, 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 let's try and do the best we can. But I also say we should add a focus on re uh, remediation and repair. Why? Because 
I've, I've heard some of the folks at Treasury talk about 2000, the fall of 2008 and the, the early 2009, and it was like, what can we do? What's there? You know, they go home and read the, read the regs and go, oh, we can do this, and then they come back and try it. I'm really going to urge the regulators in the room to think in advance about a, a, a financial, uh, uh, fintech-based uh, crash. And I know people are doing some of this. I've heard that the Treasury is actually doing some of this. It's cool. I, I, I encourage it to do more. Um, I anticipate it. Uh, scenario development, gaming and simulating, malicious and ac accidental. You know, plan it out. See what, what, what's happening. And then develop responses that would be suitable to those. And then get the response authority so it's legal, the legal power to act in that context and do it in advance rather than running around when, when, when everybody's um, um, uh, 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 pants are on fire and trying to figure it out. Uh, now, you're not going to be perfect at this, but if you set up, you know, get, get, get congressional and regulatory authority to do some of this stuff that you know you're going to need to do when this does happen, it would be a good idea to, 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 to plan that way. Think about Ethereum and the hard fork. Right? Ethereum had to do a hard fork, right? That was when they, when they said Thursday didn't happen and we're over here. Okay? Uh, and, 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 and we may have to do that for elements or indeed the entire financial system when something happens. Why? Because already, as has been discussed, the Trojans are sitting there in, in, in the SWIFT system. You know that. I mean, the SWIFT system's got Trojans from, our, from folks who could be potentially our adversaries, and when the time comes, they're going to hit the button, and all the money's going to go to, 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 I don't know, someplace else, right? Um, and when that happens, we've got to have the legal authority not to sit around and go, ah, but instead to say, oh, that happened. Okay, the legal authority is that that day didn't happen. Swift, you're just sorry about that. We're back there. We're, we're going to do something else. So anyway, I, that's, that's my second point is we need to be ready for that. And the final thought is that the new models of, for money and finance and fintech are just fabulous in, 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 in what they're providing me as an academic. I know they're dangerous to whatever they're providing the rest of the world, but me as an academic, they're so cool because we're actually able to really rethink the special role of money and currency, among other things. All these finance things, they're open up again. Uh, this private money, we're getting private money. We, didn't, we haven't had private money in 150 years, right? We've got private money again. Credo money versus fiat currency, whoa, you know, is that possible? What does it look like? Uh, um, uh, um, uh, um, and the money supply regulation without a central bank. My, my, my friend Mark over here tells me, no, we can't do that. They're doing it. Uh, cool. Um, and it provokes notions like a biology analogy. For instance, the emission and, re and, and, and reabsorption of money by the system can, I think, be analogized into a homeostasis in biology because with that kind of process going all the time with neurotransmitters, right? The serotonin is getting pushed out and reabsorbed and pushed out. It strikes me as what kind of what's happening with money with banking and things. Anyway, it gives us a chance to rethink this. So, points. Uh, first of all, uh, think about generativity when we're creating uh, rule sets. It's a different criteria and a useful one to, uh, to add to our, our, our classical um, 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 uh, economic efficiency and, and other models. Secondly, um, um, uh, yes, my, my, my trousers are, 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 are blazing. Uh, uh, you know, uh, get ready for that meltdown and, and have the authority in place to do something about it rather than, than, than run around when the time comes. And finally, um, let's, in the meantime, let's have some fun with, with what FinTech makes possible for us to examine. Thanks very much. So, uh, roughly 10 years ago, 10 and a half years ago, thereabout, I'd written a book on, uh, on innovation. And I shared it with my senior finance colleague at Columbia. He said, this is a terrific book, but you are not, you sh there should be a chapter then why American innovation is so good. So I said, pray tell, why is American inv innovation so good? He said, it's because we have a terrific financial system. Now, this is in early 2008. Uh, and I said, you know, we have to agree to disagree. I think we have a terrific innovation system in spite of a pathological financial system, not because of the financial system we have. Uh, and I am sorry to say that the pathologies which I had in mind then have not gone away in, in, in the last 10 years. And many of the innovations that you see in, in FinTech, I mean, FinTech has become sort of a catch-all phrase for practically anything. Uh, have to do uh, are a reaction to this foundation, this pathological foundation, which has been in place for the last 10, 20, 30 years. Uh, the view I'm going to offer is not a mainstream finance view. So let, let me start with some someone which is someone's view, which is sort of 
quasi-mainstream, and, and, and I take this from Raghur Rajan's celebrated 2005 speech. And it, it, it was prophetic because he pointed out that there were significant ma uh, misalignments of incentives, and these incentives were systemic, systemically dangerous, etc., etc. Et but if you go through that speech carefully, you'll find that there's a second part to it. And the second part to it celebrated the developments in finance that had taken place over the preceding 30 years. And essentially, does this, does this go forward on that one? Uh, essentially, what he had said was, over the last 30 years, we had witnessed a revolutionary technology-led transformation of finance. And the revolution had entailed turning virtually all financial transactions from being relationship-based to transactions based in an arm's length anonymous market. Uh, Raghu attributed this change principally to exogenous information technology and finance, financial technology advances. And he basically said regulation, oh, that's just basically an accommod has played an accommodative role particularly deregulation, and so sort of these exogenous changes came first, and deregulation accommodated to it, and therefore we, we, we got this change, and he said this is a fantastic boost to entrepreneurship and, uh, and economic growth, and oh, by the way, there are, are also some malaligned mal incentives. Uh, I disagree with most of this. There certainly has been this revolutionary change. Uh, I do not think it has been led by uh, exogenous technological changes. It, I don't think it has been led by exogenous changes in finance theory. It has been led by regulation. Uh, and it, it, and it, it can only be undone if it needs to be undone by regulation. So here's my view of the world. So these are... There's a great fascination for completing markets. I mean, it's a, it's a wonderful rhetorical device, isn't it? I mean, who could be for incomplete markets? You have to complete markets. That, 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 that's necessarily an advance. And, and, and this is a seductive chimera, I, I believe, amongst policymakers and amongst, uh, amongst economists that we, we must complete markets. But what are the minimal conditions, and I stress the word minimal, uh, required for having arm's length anonymous market. One clearly in, is an adequate supply of, of, of the float of interchangeable, uh, of, of interchangeable claims. You have to have, say, an issue of a billion dollars for, this, for stuff to trade. Secondly, and more subtly, you need demand for these claims from buyers who are willing to forego the information that they, would, they could or would get in a private transaction. And these are two minimal claims. Historically, these two minimal conditions have been satisfied by treasury, by treasury bonds and by, uh, by high-grade debt. And you could do this because it is easy to create float. It's not difficult for IBM to I issue a billion, dollar, uh, to ha a billion dollar bond. The treasury finds it even e easier to issue a, 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 a billion dollar bond. Uh, with IBM, there's tons of information available, in naturally available in the public domain or which can be made available. With treasury bonds, there may not be so much information available, but people really don't care to, to get private information because they are considered risk-free. And then add to this, there are underwriter and issuer, issuer reputational incentives to, to produce this. Now, these conditions do not exist for securitization, particularly of securitization of mortgages or the securitization of small consumer loans. Uh, in order to create a billion dollar issue, you have to put together something like two or 300,000 credit card receivables. So, the, 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 so, so there is, there's a fiddling that you have to do to create this b b billion dollar loan. Secondly, you cannot disclose information about the 200,000 borrowers. It's impossible. It's, it's, it, 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 it is just practically uh, impossible. Uh, and sort of who really knows if you're, go if you're going to have 300,000 ultimate borrowers, who the underwriter was who figured out whether th this, this was a credit worthy borrower or not. So none of these conditions exist. And therefore, I would argue, you, have not ha you did not have until about the mid-80s uh, mid 
any securitization market in mortgage-backed securities or, or to speak of or in credit card debt. But then we had a takeoff. Uh, the stuff grew like Topsy. It grew from a few hundred uh, billion dollars to in, 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 the, in the 1980s to something like six or seven trillion dollars, that's trillion with a T. There was a, 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 a retreat, and the, but it's pretty much come back to where it is. So how did what, what is not a naturally tradable market become tradable? And in my, in my explanation, this is not because someone had some fantastic IT innovation or someone came up with a, with a finance theory that did this. In my, in my account, it's principally regulatory forces that elevated FICO scores to a central position, to, to, uh, or brought FICO scores to a central position in, 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 the, in, the, in the issuance of, uh, of consumer credit and the issuance of mortgage credit. Uh, they enabled, in the first instance, a vast, a huge increase in GSE securitizations. Those of you who are familiar with the history of, uh, of GSEs, it was roughly in, in, in 1995 that the, that the GSEs went from underwriting standards which are based on thick underwriting books to ex virtually exclusive reliance on FICO scores as the principal yardstick of, uh, of, uh, of borrower creditworthiness. Uh, more subtly, they have mitigated the problem of information problems in, 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 in issuing credit card debt and, 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 and car loan debt, etc. Because essentially there's no information asymmetry problem. If the credit card issuer says, look, the only thing we're going to look at about the borrower is the FICO score, uh, and that's all we know, so we are not going to sell you our lemons. If the only thing that someone who's, who's issuing a car loan is looking at is, 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 is a FICO score, again, that information asymmetry problem completely disappears. Now, clearly, if you, if you collect less information, defaults are likely to go up. But the investor doesn't care as long as there is an interest rate commensurate with the high rate of defaults uh, that goes along with this reduced information. Uh, I would suggest uh, very strongly that this strange elevation of FICO scores was not the result. Uh, it's not because we are a libertarian society. It, it, is, it, it, is, the, it is the result of, uh, of regulation. Uh, the use of FICO scores in, uh, by the GSEs in 1995 was explicitly driven by, uh, by the trillion dollar initiative. And the only really quick way to, to do this was to, was, was to switch over to an underwriting process based principally on FICO scores. In consumer, in consumer debt, the, the, the mechanism is, is somewhat peculiar. Again, to some degree, you have to attribute it to uh, Laziness, uh, and the, 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 there were there were and there are these fair lending laws. And the easiest way to enforce a fair lending law is to penalize anyone who does, looks at anything beyond the FICO score. Because if you look at a FICO, FICO score, you can you, and, and nothing else. If you do not see the face of the person who's who, who, who's coming who's coming in through the door, then and you had no control over the FICO score, then you are then that provides a safe harbor. To any, to, to any credit card debt you issue. And if you go through the fair lending examination guides of, say, the FDIC, they, they, tell, they, they, tell you this, uh, they tell you this explicitly. The fair lending examiner first looks to see whether or not you're using a judgmental system. If you're using a judgmental system, you are, you're already in, uh, in uh, regulatory hot water. Then they look to see whether you're using a customized uh, scoring system or you're using a generic scoring system. Uh, if you're using a customized scoring system, then you have to justify that the, the scoring that, that, that you do is, is, is okay. And then they look at the degree to which there are uh, discretionary overrides. If, if there is more than a certain percentage of discretionary overrides, or if these discretionary overrides are exercised at the level of, uh, of the branch, uh, again, you're in trouble. So what do the lenders do? They say, fine, we're, we're simply going to look at FICO scores, uh, more or less. And we are going to turn this into a lending machine. And you know, yes, so we, we get quote unquote fair lending as a, as a process, but we also get this massive securitization. Uh, since I have two minutes, I will. <laughs>
finally, I, I would say we've created enormous demand for tradable assets through an ideology that, that favors pay-as-you-go, that has gone from pay-as-you-go savings to, uh, to, to a system that says you must save for retirement. And this has principally been done through ERISA. And ERISA says you have to fully fund your, 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 your pension plans. And interestingly enough, the ERISA also very strongly leans on fiduciaries to invest in tradable diversified assets. But in the natural cost, there are only so many tradable diversifiable assets available. And this has created a huge incentive for Wall Street to produce tradable assets which did not exist before. And lo and behold, we have produced $6 trillion of tradable uh, credit card debt and, uh, and mortgage debt. So all this stuff has come together because of regulation, not because of, uh, of, of exogenous changes. Uh, if, you, if this seems kind of weird to you, uh, let, 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 let me point out the difference between what's happening in financial markets uh, versus in real markets. If one looks at the real economy, there are very, very few things that are actually traded in anonymous markets. Grains, pork bellies, metals, pre-industrial stuff, very recently, uh, memory chips. P pretty much nothing in the real sector, virtually nothing in the real sector is traded in, in, in anonymous markets. Uh, what you find in, in, in the real sector is that this anonymization of transactions is, decre is decreasing, not increasing. So historically, when you, you, many transactions which you had to do blind without knowing the identity of the seller or without knowing anything about the, about the idiosyncrasy of what, of what you are, has been steadily decreasing. It's been decreasing in uh, this thing, in, uh, in things like Yelp. In the old days, if you, if you wanted to get a plumber, you looked up the yellow pages, you had no idea who, who, who the plumber was. Today, you can go to Yelp and, and look up the person's ratings. <laughs> it has increased in, uh, in Airbnb. So you can, you can now actually, you, you can actually see, uh, in, in, again, when I was a kid, you, you, went to, you ordered a, uh, a bed and breakfast, you had no idea what you're gonna get. Today with Airbnb, you can actually see the pictures of where, where you're going to land up. With Uber, a taxi you basically wave down off the street. It's an anonymous transaction. With Uber, you can now see who the, what the name of the driver is, what kind of car is being driven, what, what, what the ratings of the car are. And believe it or not, this has even been happening in BDSM intermediation. Uh, let me not get into details. Uh, uh, and the this thing is just com completely messed up. Uh, so what we are getting in the real sector is better matching and less uh, commoditized anonymity. And what we have in the financial sector is completely the opposite. Uh, is this going to change because of fintech? My answer is sadly no, and it will not change unless you change the underpinnings which have made financial markets so anonymous and so arm's length. Thank you. So what I think is particularly funny is that I, you know, Matt mentioned the fact that I uh, was a big proponent of slides. Actually, we're probably just going to have <laughs> one slide that we're really going to focus on, in part because the entire conference has discussed many of the issues that we'll discuss uh, today, both on this panel and uh, both because I recognize that I'm the last speaker on the last panel of a two-day conference. Despite what you believe, there is self-awareness with academics. Uh, <laughs> and so uh, we're just going to really make this fast by concentrating on Oh! <laughs> There's also a certain irony <laughs> when during a fintech conference there are problems with PowerPoint. Ah, okay. I can also I can use I can use my fingers. Okay. Uh, okay. So I, my comments today are going to be based off of a paper. I guess there will be two slides. I'll tell you how to. Uh, where to get it with my co-author, uh, Yish Yada, who's back there. Uh, and it's a paper called The Fintech Trilemma. The Fintech Trilemma. And the idea behind the trilemma 
uh, besides the fact that it's uh, in today's uh, world of artificial intelligence and that human beings can't really remember more than three uh, digits to their telephone numbers, we thought that there were effectively three critical elements to rule making when thinking through why exactly is it so difficult for uh, regulators, for uh, financial regulatory authorities and others to come up with a suitable regime for dealing with uh, financial innovation and financial technology. Uh, one of the questions that you've heard over the last two days is uh, amongst the many questions are, number one, how do you regulate fintech? Number two, how do you create a regulatory regime that's adaptable enough to uh, engage ever-changing financial innovations? Number three, uh, how is it that you can avoid uh, the soft capture that Matt had mentioned for this panel? Uh, these questions are so difficult, uh, we argue in the paper, uh, that when you look at the history of regulating financial innovation generally, not just from a, a fintech perspective, but just financial innovation generally, uh, we argue uh, that you inevitably see a kind of policy trilemma, that when seeking to provide clear rules, maintain market integrity, and encourage financial innovation, regulators generally uh, are only able to fully achieve, at best, two of the three goals. Uh, for example, encouraging innovation by simplifying rules to expand access to financial markets has typically created risks for market integrity, uh, where rules are designed, for example, to ease barriers to entry and lower compliance costs to encourage financial innovation. Uh, we've seen in the past risks emerge uh, as firms fail to uh, adopt proper practices and, and fail to internalize the proper costs of their activities. So think of things like uh, the Commodity Futures uh, uh, Modernization Act, um, uh, among, amongst many others. Uh, meanwhile, if an agency seeks simple rules uh, that attain market stability, uh, rules will uh, largely be disabling as opposed to enabling, uh, and not much financial innovation will likely be permitted. In other words, uh, you, in order to promote rule simplicity to achieve market stability, regulators are likely to install bright line legal limitations to innovation, like banning financial products or selling fixed or setting fixed boundaries as to the scope as to what firms in any particular market. Can Someone's asking me to actually talk louder. You can always see that. So um, I'll just to repeat the big idea. Um, uh, again, uh, if regulators or if an agency seeks simple rules to attain market stability, rules will be uh, often more disabling as opposed to enabling, and you won't see too much financial innovation. In other words, in order to promote rules simplicity, simple rules, and in order to achieve market stability, regulators are likely to install bright line legal limitations to innovation, like banning financial products or setting very discrete boundaries for the scope of permitted activities, regardless as to how much technological advancements are made. And then finally, uh, and, and some people would, would, would argue that um, different kinds of rules, historically, you could see Glass-Steagall fitting in some uh, parts of it, uh, but finally, if regulation wishes to enhance market integrity and to maintain financial innovation, any rules that regulators will uh, ultimately devise will uh, inevitably be very complex uh, and usually to match the intricacies of new financial technologies. So uh, the jury's still out, still relatively new. Uh, Dot Frank could be considered somewhat uh, complex and falling in that particular uh, category. So you end up with a little bit of a trilemma, right? Because everybody wants to hit this very interesting uh, sweet spot where you can achieve all three, but at least historically, uh, if you're thinking about achieving all three, uh, you, you, particularly in their, in, in their most robust sense, you're not able to do so. And we argue in the paper uh, that this is not, again, uh, a problem that you've only seen with fintech, but fintech exacerbates this trilemma. It makes it even more difficult. And it's made it more difficult for many of the reasons that we've talked about over the last two days of this conference. That you have a reliance on smaller, non-incumbent firms, uh, many with uh, very limited track records and with untested technologies, but with exciting prospects for changing the delivery of financial services and perhaps financial inclusion and other worthy goals.
Uh, you also have a heavy reliance on big data and the design of fintech products, uh, and it's not often uh, easy to understand the exact uh, financial or technological architecture supporting uh, that along with the automation of the delivery of financial services. And then finally, you have the very uh, quick, ever-progressing uh, changes in the market uh, ecosystem and in technology itself, uh, which means that uh, innovation is changing at such a rate that it's hard for regulators to keep pace with those innovations. Right? So these three aspects of fintech are combined in a way um, that is different, at least uh, from historical precedent, particularly when you look at the pace of innovation and change and when you look at the fact that uh, non-incumbent new upstarts are effectively disintermediating traditional gatekeepers and traditionally uh, dominant players in industries many times. So how do you deal with, those, with these kinds of changes and with these kinds of regulatory challenges? Well, again, uh, we've heard about uh, more than a couple from uh, Elizabeth Jacobs. Uh, we've heard about no action letters, also from the CFPB. Um, you hear about pilots. There are charters and licenses, and then there are regulatory sandboxes. Now, for those of you who happen to watch the regulatory politics of these kinds of things, uh, when you discuss the different tools in the toolbox, it's a little bit of a kind of West Side story where some people will say, no, 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 I don't do sandboxes. I only do no action letters. Or I don't do no action letters. What I do are pilot projects. And instead of trying to demarcate and sort of uh, demonstrate the superiority of any one particular approach, we argue that it's best to look at these approaches as really operating on a kind of a spectrum, right? And that each are dealing with either the limitations of their own regulatory and administrative mandates or the technology in question, and obviously the political uh, priorities um, that different kinds of regulations, excuse me, regulatory jurisdictions uh, may have. And uh, you go and evolve along, let's, let's say, a, a, an ever uh, more ambitious uh, uh, set of policies that I guess you could say are culminating right now in sandboxes which tend to pick and choose and to combine various actions, or excuse me, various uh, tools like no action letters, pilots, licenses, and the like in order to experiment, set parameters, test, and gather data and information. Uh, we'd like to uh, nonetheless say that these, these kinds of strategies um, are useful. Uh, they should be recognized as an attempt to bridge this uh, trilemma. Uh, they can be also viewed as a means of operating, perhaps not at the poles, but, but mitigating some of the trade-offs. Uh, but even these have to be supported by additional supplemental administrative strategies uh, in order to mitigate, but not eliminate the fintech trilemma. Amongst the kinds of tools in the toolbox um, that are necessary are some of the themes that I think we've already heard in the conference, but it's useful to think through particularly in light of uh, Matt's suggestions. We uh, know that in order to achieve effective regulation, you're going to need some domestic agency cooperation, that is at the domestic level. Um, at the same time, you're going to need international standard setting and a better private uh, self-governance of emerging technologies. Now, they sound very simple, but I think that uh, thinking about things in terms of a fintech trilemma can be a useful uh, framework for just thinking through different kinds of problems. So just now, Matt mentioned the soft capture problem. Like, you know, this is a real challenge. Like, how do you end up making sure that you don't over-rely on the information and the data that are provided to you? Well, that's a good question. Well, at least when you're engaging in a good deal of domestic agency coordination, you can com not only compare ex ante the kinds of rules that you're setting for developing your own domestic regulatory experimentation, but you should be able to have data inputs from uh, similarly situated market participants, and you can at least compare discrepancies, uh, particularly that emerge uh, within a different regulatory uh, ecosystem. Um, internationally, those kinds of gains can even be even more pronounced. That is that you will be able to compare uh, 
perhaps different kinds of data fields. It would be very useful to be, begin to harmonize some of those data fields, but you can certainly uh, uh, think through what kind of information that other regulatory agencies may be gathering from their own testing. Uh, and then finally, uh, you can uh, think through best practices in terms of not just uh, supervision, but also the rulemaking process for those sandboxes, for those pilots, and the like. And you don't really see, to my knowledge, that much work being done thus far uh, in this way. So when you sent, tend to see uh, news reports about fintech hubs coordinating and cooperating, you're not really hearing things about um, establishing benchmark parameters for different experiments and then sharing the useful data in a way such that there is a collaborative um, um, international interagency coordination uh, to gather as much information as possible for establishing best practices. If you look at the MOUs between major financial hubs, there's very rarely an enforcement, uh, actually I've never seen uh, an enforcement component to those MOUs. Instead, they're more along the lines of how can you get different domestic market participants into another jurisdiction, as well as sort of thinking through a multifaceted, more robust, deeper coordination. Uh, again, when it comes to setting data parameters, testing that data, gathering that data, and sharing at least some of the results of that data so that different jurisdictions can not only develop interoperable rules, but also the rules that really fit an ever-changing uh, market ecosystem and landscape. At any rate, I know my limitations, and I know I'm the last person. So uh, if you're interested, the other slide, oh no, okay, FinTech Trilemma. <laughs> FinTech Trilemma, that's it, thanks. About 20 minutes. I think if uh, if you like, we can open it up for for questions. And maybe while I'm waiting to see any hands go up, I'll ask one of the group, which is I think it was Melissa earlier was talking about this question of when um, some sort of an infrastructure is developing, uh, thinking about the extent to which you're creating a public good um, and want to create that kind of opportunity for uh, you know, uh, a, a public good to develop in the role of government of that, or whether you want to allow um, whatever is being created to be created with the, you know, potentially initially a, a financial incentive or otherwise. I think uh, in the paperwork crisis of, what was it, 66, when QCIP evolved, the thought was, well, uh, we'll have all the industry get together and they'll create this way of identifying securities and we'll get rid of the backlog of uh, the, the, you know, the after trade activities and we'll solve that problem. And here we are um, some decades later um, dealing with a, uh, a, a vended product um, that's done terrific good but often uh, creates complexities because there's a proprietary structure over, over QCIPIC itself. And so, um, maybe I could get the reaction for, for each, from each of you about how to think about that trade-off. First of all, I think that's a very interesting example, in part because the, that paperwork crisis was itself, ironically, a product of a, of a desired shift, even before the regulatory intervention, to introduce more um, uh, uh, computerized record-keeping that didn't really work out at, quite as well as people had in, in, intended. And it was um, a story of the partial and not fully integrated uh, reg tech into um, uh, your back office uh, work. Um, and, and, and I think that's going to be a constant challenge, is, is how do you develop the appropriate standards? And to really make sure that whatever uh, both FinTech and reg tech, tech um, delivery of financial services arises, actually does what people say it's going to do, you know, and, 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 and that's, that's extraordinarily uh, difficult. Um, uh, and I think it also poses real questions for uh, an administrative, for today's administrative state. People don't really think about the fact that our administrative state was premised on um, a society in which change itself was, would was moving at a more incremental uh, speed. And when you think about the Administrative Procedure Act, it was, not just, it was just not built, right, to be able to um, 
respond quickly and to adapt quickly to these 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 kinds of challenges. And just as you, in my view, just as, as you have to upgrade um, your supervisory practices, you also have to upgrade your administrative practices to get precisely um, to that question as, as, as to what your best uh, regulatory response is going to be. And I don't want to say that's just a, you know, that all this is just a question of process, but when there is no, <laughs> when there is no process, you have to start somewhere. And I think that um, uh, in order to get to a proper substantive decision, you, you have to have the, the, the appropriate structures in place. And what I've heard repeatedly um, uh, from folks in lots of different regulatory agencies is, is that that structure um, is not always in place if it's dominated by one-shot rulemaking that gets heavily politicized. I mean, frankly, even notice and comment processes are, are, are themselves bias to the extent to which you have stakeholders who may have their own agendas and providing only certain kinds of data that they may have. So it's it, it, that, that the problem or the question of soft capture, for example, is not exactly one that may be limited uh, uh, to financial or excuse me, regulatory experimentation in the fintech space. Right? You, you, I mean, are you really getting rid of it when you're just getting you know, uh, responses uh, to your proposals from certain segments of um, you know, industry or even um, uh, consumer folks, you know, are, are they are they not coming with a certain interest involved? Um, that's my initial. Having having spoken against um, uh, uh, the thought that that uh, we should look at incentive structures, I'm now going to say that we should in this context, because um, uh, at least a, a portion of the problem you're talking about is is. Um, what what is the the structure of, of the game? Is is the game um, uh, one where where there is enough alignment of interest without a a, a, a an external coordinator that that you can Im expect the, the the solution to emerge? Uh, driving on one side of the road or the other is is a good example of this. Once once you you have a the crystal set of be on the right, it becomes very quickly self enforcing. Um, um, yes, there will be occasional odd people who will drive on, on, on the wrong side, but they, 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 are, they are weeded out of the population fairly quickly. Um, uh, so, so again, there is no incentive, counter incentive to say, hey, I'm driving on the other side and I'm going to reap the benefits of that. Um, so, uh, but, but many, many coordination problems um, involve um, a, 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 some, some discordance of, of incentive structure. So, so setting up... Um, a, Oliver, so, well, so, so in, in that regard, I mean, how do you view this? I mean, do you view fintech regulation as, as implicating largely harmonious objectives and incentives? Or I, I view it as, 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 a, as a mixed bag. I mean, there will, there will be pieces of the puzzle that, that will be like driving on one side of the road. There'll be other pieces of the puzzle that won't. I'm actually trying to set up in, in a standard setting uh, uh, exercise where I'm trying to help coordinate a process to set standards around the data specification for legal contracting. Uh, which is all over the place. We're kind of in that in that early, you know, uh, word perfect word. You know, all these different standards floating around out there, and and um, uh, the, the 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 it's a it is a coordination problem where there is enough divergence of interest that it's not it's not naturally occurring. So uh, you, you, that doesn't mean you can't have a private process to bring those interests together. And that's uh, if you talk to the folks at NIST, um, um, uh, you know, they're, they're experts at, at where you know what, what's going to work with the private, what's going to work with the public, you know, where 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 you where you where you do that piece. Uh, um, and and as you say, the metagame of of, of 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 will be played where, where folks who have actually got got at stake in not solving the problem will will try and make sure we don't. Uh, it's 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 a layered process. A really clever governmental intervention can be very helpful in that. And I, again, I point to NIST as for folks who are in the in the business of that. Uh, the financial regulators are not are not unaware of those problems, and at their best, can 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 hopefully do a, do a pretty good job of that. But yeah, it's not a one size fits all circumstance. Uh, so I have a, uh, a quick uh, comment for Amar, and then a question for Chris. Um, Amar, in your um, framework. Um, in terms of the effect of regulation on financial innovation, um, the two examples you picked out for that role seem odd. I'm always a little worried about or skeptical of claims that uh, a regulation that is relatively marginal with respect to the financial system 
drives that much change in the financial system. So fair lending laws, I think, are not an especially plausible channel for what you described. And I think that the interdisciplinary approach that we've been talking about, may we may need a little bit more economic historians involved on that question to, to better answer it, but open to your suggestions. Um, Chris, this really comes out of your comment in response to Matt's first question, which is, um, is your triangle really more like a parallelogram or some other shape? Um, so the, your three corners are all um, elements of what you could think of as efficacy. That is, trade-offs among a set of values having to do with whether the proposed rule or approach is accomplishing some end. But we also have lots of standards for, and, and this is consistent with your comment, we have lots of standards for rulemaking that are not about the efficacy of the rule, but about its legitimacy. So, you know, is it responsive to democratic concerns? Is, is there transparency involved? Are the regulators accountable for enacting the rule? Much of our legal system is built on not efficacy, but on legitimacy. So maybe you could brainstorm with us a little bit about how to think about the link between that legitimacy goal and your trilemma. So, so first of all, everyone should know that he, he asked me that really hard question only because I didn't say that he hadn't solved the trilemma himself when he was you know, <laughs> devising the doctrine. And this is, this is, this is, this is retaliation. Um, so that's, that's a, uh, that's a extremely good point. And, uh, you know, what, the, the simple answer is, for the purposes of the paper, I have an answer about the paper, and then I have a, a, a larger meta question that you're asking, which is much more uh, difficult. So the paper is, is an academic paper, and theory paper, looking at sort of these three critical sort of policy aspirations in the rule writing process. And certainly there was some frustration, I think, for, um, Almost anyone who's, who's watched everything ranging from uh, the f implementation of financial reforms in the wake of the final cr financial crisis to the ability of our regulatory agencies to come up to speed and to get up to speed quickly enough with really some very radical and profound changes in the financial market, um, in the delivery of financial uh, services. And, and a lot of, some folks have said, well, is this going to be big or is this not going to be big? I tend to think it's going to be big, and I, think, I tend to think it's going to be big largely because we're heading in a direction where you can have critical financial intermediaries and gatekeepers like clearing houses potentially disintermediated, disintermediated by new technologies which raises certain kinds of questions about financial stability as well as effectiveness and as well as financial inclusion. Um, some good, some bad, uh, but I, I think that to the extent to which they encroach upon, replace or are relied upon by these sort of critical elements in our financial market infrastructure and become part of our critical elements of our financial market infrastructure, that it's extremely important that regulators are able to get up to speed in terms of understanding exactly what they are and then in terms of what they do. And as a response to that sort of, I think, uh, frustration, you know, you, you can't help but just ask yourself, um, why is this the case, you know, and, and what is it about particularly fintech, because it is the emerging issue of this particular um, policy-making cycle, you know, what is it that makes it particularly different? And in my, again, in my opinion, a lot of people say, ah, financial innovation is always different. And I'm like, well, it's, it's true, but there's a certain matrix of problems that, 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 that tend to make it difficult. And so for the purposes of this paper, we identified these three elements that are sort of germane to the rulemaking, uh, you know, rulemaking a process. There are three things that regulators tend to aspire towards, and we wanted to show that just getting those three things right, much less other issues, is extremely difficult. Now, when you move outside of that space into the broader questions of legitimacy, uh, then you get into the kinds of questions as to, well, uh, you know, what is what is the language of regulation? You know, um, how is it? Uh, you know, to what extent can you, you know, I, I was talked, I was joked to people about the fact that, you know, uh, who, who would argue that bank regulation is not uh, very legitimate or democratic. I, I always ask, well, would the is the better alternative to ask 
uh, your friends and neighbors and grandparents about the intricacies of the leverage ratio under Basel III, right? Like that's that's not a that is not a a, a part of the um, d you know of, of 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 the normal societal discourse. And you know, as 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 society evolves, you know, there is a space by which the uh, you know to which I mean, you know, you rely upon experts in order to to reach. Um, uh, to, in order to reach sound policy goals. But the legitimacy itself has to be founded upon uh, uh, oh, you know, a certain level of transparency with you know, elected representatives, and that just brings about sort of deeper questions, not necessarily about the, perhaps the Administrative Procedure Act, but about the mandates and the missions and the degree to which elected representatives visit and revisit those mandates and I think that there is something to be said about making sure, you know, how do you make sure that rules that are in place are, are responsive to the needs of, of, of society and don't become um, uh, unwitting obstacles to achieving the, actually the policy goals that were ultimately uh, used to found them. And, and, and that's a, a bigger question. It's not, it's not a question for the paper, um, but I, you, you, you know, it's, it's true, like regulatory experimentation, experimentation, how do you, you know, I'm not entirely certain how you would introduce that particular traditional concepts of democratic legitimacy into a, a pilot program to, to try to check, check, track uh, applications of distributed ledger technologies. You know, I, I don't know. So, I know you didn't ask a question, but since you made a comment, I think. <laughs> uh, I feel impelled to respond to it. Uh, my, I would have thought my explanation was preposterous myself three years ago. So, so and you, you put it more gently than I did. I would have said, "What a pile of nonsense!" Uh, I, but I am. I, I have subsequent in the last three years, I have done extensive interviews with lenders, both in the United States and in Europe. And here's what I'm confident about, and here's what speculation. Uh, I am highly confident that fair lending laws have significantly truncated the information that lenders in the United States collect on consumers. And I'm also highly confident that, that, that this has increased reliance on FICO scores. Uh, I see that in small business lending in the United States where you do not have these laws, you do not have this process, I see that in Europe where you have a different regulatory regime, uh, the regulatory regime has pushed lenders into exactly the opposite direction to collect more information. And, and, and uh, so, uh, and, and th this is what my bank of friends tell me, that, that we are we're terrified of this and that this is basically frames how we lend to, to consumers. The degree to which this has or has not affected uh, securitization is speculative. And uh, the, uh, the, 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 the only two things I'll say in defense of, of, of my speculation is that one, where you have a different lending process in small business lending or, 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 or lending in Europe, securitization is de minimis. Uh, I can see a mechanism for why uh, Ignorance is bliss as far as securitization is concerned, uh, which basically it means that, that, that you've taken away the, uh, the securitization problem. And uh, I don't see any other explanation. So pending some more plausible explanation for why there is $6 trillion more of securitization of a certain kind of loan in the United States when there isn't in Europe, when European issuance of traditional bonds is now on par and in some years in, in excess of American issuance of corporate bonds. There may be some other explanation, but I, I, I haven't seen it. Is this on now? Uh, I wanted to uh, follow up on a, uh, Matthew's comment <clears throat> about the rating agencies. The broken model, broken by the Xerox machine, Certainly, the uh, seller of the securities buying the ratings proved to be broken, bankrupt, uh, 
not just broken, a disaster. Uh, and that model is still in effect. We're looking at it more closely, but it's still in effect. And over time, doubtless, the problems will reemerge. There's a third model, which is very simple, and I can describe it with 19th century technology, which is issuer of the bond not directly pay the rating agency, but pay a fee to a government agency such as the SEC. The SEC then says, we have a, an, or a lottery urn with 100 balls in it, and we will put as many balls in the urn as reflect current market share. And when the seller of the bond, of the instrument, wants a rating, the SEC has someone reach over his shoulder and reach into the urn and pull up a ball that says Moody's or S&P or Fitch or whatever. So that there is no market, no market incentive for the rater, the rating agency, to do a favor because they didn't get selected by their, by their laxity. And then over time, you can give them report cards and put fewer balls or more balls in the urn, depending on how dependable their performances are. It's really quite simple. 21st century technology uh, could improve on the description I've given uh, through uh, random, uh, random generation of numbers, et cetera. Yeah, that, uh, I, I was at the commission uh, uh, at times, uh, during the crisis and as it followed, and that particular idea was discussed. Um, there are any number of reasons for why it didn't get adopted, but I think a number maybe having to do with the influence of the commoners and uh, industry itself uh, having the ability to shape uh, the business model. Um, you'll recall that for years there were only three rating agencies, and it was quite some time before uh, that was even opened up, uh, a fairly closed system. Can I say one quick? Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I heard this problem with rating agencies ad nauseum, and, and I'm sure that I mean, there's no question that, that, that there is a, an incentive problem there. But let me also say that there, is, there are exactly those incentive problems with the issuance of corporate bonds. And the, 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 kind, the, the, the incentives for rating agencies to, to be paid by the issuer exist in traditional corporate bonds as well. Uh, there was, there's, a, there's an underwriter incentive problem with traditional corporate bonds. That, has not, that, that did not prove to be a significant problem, even in junk bonds. It, so the question is, why did it show up just in, in, this, in this particular corner of the, uh, of the tradable market? And there, my explanation, preposterous as it may be, is that the problem is not with the rating agencies of people rating the issue. It was the issue of rating the credit of the individual borrowers and the excessive reliance on those on, on, on those FICO scores. Speculation. So it's. Could, could I just say, like, could you could you also? I mean, particularly when you get into more exotic structured products, where there, where the the rating agency is itself directly dependent on talking about soft capture, the direct information given to it by a credit rating agency, and you're not operating in a space where you have, in a traditional vanilla bond market context, where you have other rating agencies who can provide their own ratings, there, there, there's, there's less discipline, right? And more reliance on so the credit rating agency. So, so, the, so you have to, this begs the question, why there were more exotic products constructed around securitized uh, mortgages and constructed around uh, around credit cards when there are not such exotic products constructed around traditional corporate, uh, uh, large-scale corporate loans. And it also begs the question, would there have been this, this level of slicing and dicing if the underlying raw material of the securitized loans was not there to start with? Uh, just to build a little bit on Michael's comment on Chris's financial uh, uh, or rather fintech trilemma. And I, Chris, I want to tell you, I appreciate that because um, as an economist, I've trafficked in the monetary policy trilemma, and there's a financial stability trilemma uh, as well. So I'm glad to see that Danny Roderick a, was an a third trilemma that adds to the triangle. 
Uh, but just to uh, make a couple of comments and ask a question. Um, you know, it certainly would be nice to have rules that are simple uh, to address, um, you know, all problems. Just to point out, state the obvious, some of the problems that we face are not simple problems. They're intrinsically complex. Um, and uh, consequently, the rules are simple. But to go back to the underlying uh, source of those rules, they derive from uh, laws that uh, are passed and the laws themselves, maybe we could aim more directly at making some of the laws themselves more principles based to make them simpler uh, and it would be easier to derive simpler rules that could be adaptable. More fundamentally, um, you know, <clears throat> innovation is intrinsically dynamic uh, and we could also think about another leg of your triangle, market integrity, as something that evolves over time because <laughs> what was in, uh, constituted integrity for markets in uh, the last century may not be applicable to the current century as markets evolve and, and, the, and the mores and the, and the standards for integrity change. In contrast, uh, even simple or complex rules tend to be static. And to quote Paul Tucker, it is a static rule book that is the meat and drink of regulatory arbitrage and that may be even promoting the use as Mark Flood would say, to have financial technology enable regulatory arbitrage. So in our quest for simplicity and rules that fit today's and tomorrow's world, should we be looking at a, a rule book that is more dynamic than static? Yes. <laughs> And, and if I can take one second just to complete our festival of trilemmas, um, um, when we were discussing this, it, it brought back to mind to me when I've heard from computer programming folks. And the trilemma there is your computer programming project can be two of the following three, but not all, which is fast, cheap, and good. <laughs> and on the topic of fast, why don't we take one last question? This will, I think, be more in the order of a comment uh, on uh, uh, Michael's and uh, Amr's uh, uh, discussion. So, so Amr, I, I think you're on the uh, partly on the right track with uh, uh, in blaming regulation, but you, you've picked on the wrong regulation. Um, uh, and in particular, I'd take it back to uh, the first Basel Accord uh, in, in the late '80s, which was implemented in the early '90s. Um, which put 50% risk weight on uh, on mortgages, which was basically too high. It was uh, an arbitrarily chosen number. Uh, if you're going to be charged uh, a lot uh, for mortgages, there's there's basically two obvious res responses. Uh, one is to to offload the mortgages, and and uh, um, certainly the industry did that. They they started securitizing stuff uh, off the banking book. Um, and the other is you can make the uh, the loans more risky, so that you're earning enough to justify the charge. They did that too. Um, and uh, so uh, we saw a gradual move into riskier and riskier mortgage products. Uh, um, it, it, it's hard to change the credit risk. Or, I'm sorry, it's hard to change the interest rate risk in these products, but you can add credit risk, and, and uh, uh, you do that by, by digging deeper into the borrower pool. Um, and one reason why uh, uh, you see more securitization in the U.S. than, than elsewhere uh, is because the U.S. is uh, um, relatively overhoused. Uh, compared to the rest of the world. Um, we have uh, um, uh, subsidization of uh, home mortgages, and uh, we also have uh, much longer term mortgages than uh, most other countries. And a mortgage deduction for now. So, um. <laughs> so you are advancing the Bernanke loan hypothesis, which was, dates back to 1991, actually. Uh, that it's all basically re regulatory arbitrage. My, the reason I find that unpersuasive is because it was a global standard. And you could, uh, and why did this disproportionately hit the US securitization market when it, it did not have a similar effect in Europe? Uh, as far as home ownership is concerned in the US, it's a little bit higher than it is out, uh, outside the US, but there's, it has long been high. And, and there are other countries where home ownership is, is, is also high, and there has not been uh, the same level, or an, anywhere close to the same level of securitization. And certainly, home ownership would not explain the other asset backed securities classes, which are car loans and, and, and consumer loans. So there's, there's something very peculiar about America, which cannot be explained by either the Basel Accords or by, the, by, by home ownership. 
that, that's my view. Thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna do two things. Uh, we said we'd do th things in groups of three, but I'm gonna do two. First is ask you to thank the panel. Um, and the second is just use uh, my opportunity here at the mic to say uh, Dick and Michael are going to come up and say a few words to close out the conference and, um, and all the thank yous and so forth. But as the last event uh, that I will appear at with um, Dick um, uh, before he retires, I just want to take a quick moment to thank you for your service to the country and for having the vision to uh, engage the OFR in events like this uh, that bring lawyers and economists and mathematicians and others together and I hope we can carry on your work. So thank you.